Good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to the first symposium conducted and presented by the Sociology Club and also um, my introduction to social problems class. I want to welcome you to the symposium and want to thank you so much for coming out, taking your time of, out of your busy schedule to come out and be a part of this. Um, we're going to start, first of all, by giving you the purpose of this event because you want to make sure that you know what's the purpose behind this. Why are they even doing this? And so the purpose of this is for students to learn how to engage in the community and become solution oriented in their approach to addressing social problems. We want students to know that their voices can and will be heard and these voices can make a difference. One of the things that I'm passionate about as a professor um, here in the uh, sociology department is making sure that students know though when you sit in the classroom that those classes that you are taking can be applied in the real world. And we have people here today that can show you um, how you can make that happen. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Wanna welcome you. Wanna also welcome the chair of the Sociology Club, Dr. LaMessi. Would you just kind of stand or wave your hand? Dr. LaMessi, can we clap for him? Dr. LaMessi is the chair of the Sociology Club. I am a co-chair along with Pam, Dr. Pam Brown, who is another co-chair. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, my uh, department chair in her absence, Dr. Mason, and also um, other um, professors that have made this day possible. Um, we want for a moment, Dr. LaMessi, if you would come and just give a word about the Sociology Club. Uh, we're trying to recruit people. We're trying to start this organization, and hopefully some of you by the end um, of the day, of the end of this uh, presentation, that you will uh, sign up. Dr. LaMessi. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Jordan. Of course, he's not your old friend here. <laughs> I don't want to steal the thunder from the students who, whose initiative ready for this, uh, this program of the drug. I just want to let you know we started a sociology where we started the family club. We uh, we be pulling a number of uh, activities over the course of the semester. In fact, uh, very shortly, Dr. Jordan and I will put together a list of activities. This is not a club yet to one just having fun. We have fun along the way. Our mission is to make sure we provide support for you in terms of the current beyond urban state, for example, I'll just telling uh, one of our guests here. Very shortly, we're doing a workshop on how to get into graduate school, the process of the application process, how to collect letters of recommendations, the GRE. I may mean, be looking forward to holding some GRE classes free and working with somebody who may come and provide some GRE instructions free. Also, we want to have a program dressing for success. A lot of our students are unaware that when you leave school and you go to the workforce or you're applying to profit in a particular mode of dress that is now required that you enter into this new complex marketplace. Right, so the number of programs we are thinking about to help lift the standard of our students' accomplishment, both academically and in terms of extracurricular activities. So keep, you know, keep posted, you'll have everything, you'll have an email. Sign up if you have an interest in joining the club today. There's a sign-up sheet somewhere around, Professor Jordan, not so? Yes. There's a sign-up sheet, you'll know, students to come and ask. Oh, one of the big things you'll be planning very shortly is activities to raise funds for scholarship. I know many of our students here are challenged financially, and we're putting on a series of activities here towards raising funds, so at least we will help you partially fund your education while you're here. So thanks for being here, and as far as I'm concerned, that's again my my mistake. Any questions? Questions? Good. All right, so we have the sign-up sheets if you're interested in um, the Sociology Club. And right now, I'm going to ask all of my social problem students who is the brain behind today, I'm going to ask you to please come to the front. Uh, would you get those who are at the table as well? And we're going to come down front for just a moment. Um, if you would start coming down. Yes, thank you. Let's start clapping for them.
So as they're coming, um, this class, we were studying poverty, we were also studying violence. Um, students were asked to come up with solutions um, to the problems in the local community and society at large. And the solutions range from developing sustainable communities, community gardens, empowering people to be self-sufficient, and empowering our youth through community programs and partnering with the local housing authority. These smart, conscientious students are responsible for this event, and I will now ask them if they would just introduce themselves just by saying your name and also your major, and we'll start right here. Well, I'm Shalia, and I'm a physical therapy assistant major. I'm Kiana Rankins, and I'm a human health performance major. I'm Jay Irvin Beery, and I'm a nursing major. Hello, my name is Diavion Williams, and I'm a nursing major. Hello, everybody. My name is Matthew James Rochford. I am a mass communications major, focus in VR. My name is Daisy Evans, and I'm a social worker major. My name is Chastity Davis, and I'm a sociologist. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Akendria Washington, and I'm a social work major. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Bell, and I'm a social worker. My name is Anthony Shannon, and I'm an accounting major. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a biology major. All right. Can we? I'm sorry. Was there one more person? That was it. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you guys please just give them a hand clap? Um, we, we've worked hard and had long discussions about different problems in the community. And I will also want to add that I do have one other student. She's not here. Um, her name is Kiara Calhoun. And so uh, at this time, uh, sadly to say, she lost one of her twins about a month ago. She has worked hard. And even though she has not been in class, she's been just a part of this. And so I would please ask if we could offer a moment of silence uh, for her and the loss of one of her twins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give him another hand. I had car trouble. So sorry. No problem. All right, and so one, thing, one of the things that I love about having all the students come to tell you who they are and what their major is, what I love about sociology is that you can use this in any field that you go into. You have to understand and know people, know groups, how they work, how groups come together, the importance of communication. So you can use sociology um, in any uh, discipline that you choose. So uh, thank you to all of my students and thank you all again for coming. All right, and so we're going to get started because Mr. Pratt is a very busy man, um, but before he comes, we're going to introduce him uh, to the group, and so one of my students is going to come and introduce Mr. Pratt, and Mr. Pratt, you will have the floor after the introduction. Good afternoon. First off, I would like to thank everyone for taking the time out in their busy schedules to come here and support us today. Um, Mr. James Pratt is an Albany native who came home from the University of California, Irving, to conduct research for his dissertation on crime and violence in Albany, and is teaching criminal justice currently here at Albany State University. Mr. Pratt found himself drawn into the local political arena when he started my bad y'all when he started attending local government meetings. He began to draw huge support from the community and is now running for mayor of the Good Life City, Albany, Georgia. Mr. Pratt wants to address issues with poverty in the area, like taking care of renters and homeowners and managing high utility bills. These are the issues that, that we are discussing in our social problems class, and these are the reasons why we are so excited to have Mr. Pratt join the symposium discussion today. Now let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Pratt as he walks up to the platform. A little bubbly. Can everybody see me? I'm a little short, so I'll, I'll stand up here, give me, some more, give me some more space. So how's everybody doing? Good. Is, is the sound good, uh, camera? Great, thank you. So um, again, my name is James Pratt Jr. I'm a professor here at Albany State in Criminal Justice. I teach classes like race, gender, and crime, uh, juvenile delinquency, a broad array of classes that really gets to the root of how we understand crime. 
Uh, I graduated from Morehouse College. I'm actually the antithesis of sociology, psychology. So there's a little disagreement. Psychology focuses on the individual, sociology on the broader spectrum of people. But I feel like they complement each other and inform one another very deeply. As she mentioned, it's very important to have a diverse audience and a diverse perspective. And so I am a big advocate of interdisciplinarity. And that's using multiple disciplines to attack a problem. So that will ground how I talk about uh, organizing and crime. And I'll divide that, uh, hopefully divide my time between those two topics. And I'm a big advocate of using technology, so I'll be reading notes off my phone if that's all right with y'all. All right. So with community organizing, I, I thought about the key things that, was, that were important to me as I organized Albany, Georgia, and other organizations from California to Morehouse and all around this country and, and, and this world. I just came from a conference in South Africa about reconciliation and organizing and dealing with the racial legacy or, for, of apartheid. So I broke, tried to break it down into three key things that we should focus on when we think about organizing. Think about the goal. What is your goal? What do you have in mind? What is the outcome that you're looking for? What is the philosophy that guides your motivation, that guides both the goal and the next thing, the method? So your goal, your philosophy, and your method. So I thought about your goal. And how can we think about goals and, and breaking down our aspirations as community organizers? What, what, are we, what are we out to do with organizing people and money and things? So a few things uh, you can have a goal towards are changes within the system. So maybe I want to change how something works within the criminal justice system. Maybe I want to increase the diversity of lawyers in the criminal justice system because I know that when we increase diversity of judges and lawyers based on research, uh, we have better parity or equal outcomes in sentencing for all races. Maybe I want to change a piece of the system. Maybe I want to change the system itself. Maybe I want to imagine a, a new way of operating government. For example, here in Albany, Georgia, we have a weak mayor system, meaning that the mayor has the same amount of votes as a commissioner. So it's often called a ceremonial role or a policymaking role where you have, again, the equal amount of power as other commissioners. Maybe I want to change my city government structure into a strong mayor government where the mayor is more like a CEO of a company. He runs the day-to-day -day actions of the city. So that's a consideration of a goal of changing the system as a whole. Maybe I want to think individually. Maybe I want, I want to develop people and change mindsets and change how people interact with each other and see each other. And so we consider cultural change as a way of changing people and institutions. Maybe I simply want to develop new ideas. You can teach class. You can present public lectures. Events like this one are formal ways you can teach people about the issues around organizing, crime, or housing. And then finally, maybe you want a broad way of getting people to think about the world and how they see the world. And that gets more into cultural change and, and traditions and how we interact with each other. So those are some ways we can think about goals. Changes of the system, changes within the system, changes of people bringing new ideas, or completely changing the worldview as a whole. Now, the philosophical question to me is the most important one because it really does get to how we see the world and how we interact with one another. And to get to a philosophy, really thinking about how we interact and how we think about ourselves and our place in the world, we have to consider our own experiences. So the first step about organizing is really thinking about what do you, how do you exist in the world? How do you see yourself? What is your identity? What is your race, gender, and, and, and your class? And how does that impact how you navigate or are able to navigate in the world? So there are three different kind of philosophies that guide my own work. One, that's the love ethic. And Cornel West, who's a great uh, philosopher and scientist at Harvard, uh, he talks about the love ethic. And what that all is, is all about is really listening out for cries of harm and pain in our society really considering those and centering those voices as we commit to change. So that's one philosophical perspective. Two, double consciousness. Who's familiar with double consciousness in here? Got a couple people. Who's the, ori uh, uh, the originator of double consciousness? Anybody know his name? Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois. And anybody know the significance of Brother Du Bois for Albany State? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, well, a little history lesson to Albany State. 
So the founder of Albany State, who was Joseph Winthrop Holly, he was inspired to found Albany State based on W.E. Du Bois' book, Souls of Black Folks. And Souls of Black Folks actually has about three or four chapters on Doherty County, about this city, this very city, about black people post-emancipation. The book was released in 1903, and he did the interviews and the observations uh, of Albany earlier uh, in the 1900s and late to 1800s. And that's important because oftentimes we talk about several historical figures that relate to sociology, but Du Bois, Du Bois is actually one of the first sociologists, not black sociologists, but sociologists, period. He released one of the largest tomes, stories and narratives and, and thought out research projects about black people called the Philadelphia Negro. And this was in the late 1800s. So his perspective on race, double consciousness, that we as black people have to deal with different uh, oppressions and struggles while also reaching towards this American dream. It's this duality that we face and navigate as black people. So the love ethic and double consciousness. And finally, Kimberly Crenshaw talks about intersectionality. Anybody heard of the term intersectionality? A couple people. You want to try it, what, it, what it means? Excellent. A plus. So, <laughs> so what, he, what he said to sum up is that we consider the multiplicative aspects of our identity. So your race, your gender, your class, your ability, all these aspects, even your region can play a part in how you can navigate or not navigate society. So your privileges as well as your oppressions. And so the idea of intersectionality came from a black woman, Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a law professor, or still is a law professor, at UCLA. She was studying uh, women's claims, black women's claims, to, of, of oppression in their jobs. And she found that, that they couldn't get support for their gender, nor could they get support of their, of their race, because people felt that they were getting two shots at the stick to get dealt with their, their claim of oppression. And so Kimberly Crenshaw really thought about this. And she said that we have to consider how their unique experiences, as he mentioned, by these multiplicative identity properties. So those three philosophies guide my work. It helps me see how disability or ability or race and gender impact my own privileges and what I can do in society and the oppressions and the experiences that are unique and outside of my own experience. And the love ethic that drives me to be more compassionate and double consciousness that helps me to see the struggles that people face of multiple races. And finally, that leads us all to the method. So what method are you going to choose to create change? Now, none of these philosophies or methods are exclusive to one another. They all complement and can be built upon each other. So one is disruption and protests. Oftentimes, disruption and protest bring awareness to an issue. Many of you may be familiar with the civil rights movement, correct? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with the Albany movement? All right. And so the Albany movement was a movement right here that actually used disruption to create change in multiple ways here in Albany, to uh, desegregate the bus stations and stores and, and many more things. Now, a lot of people say that the Albany movement failed, but in reality, they were the starting ground for other movements that came after. They used Albany as an example, and Martin Luther King says this himself. Though we didn't meet all the goals that we wanted to do in Albany, we were able to use this experience to build in other places like Birmingham and subsequent uh, parts of the civil rights movement. So after those disruptions, you want to create spaces where people can communicate. So town hall meetings and other forms of meetings are innovative ways where you can get people at the table to get their questions, to brainstorm ideas and develop new perspectives. So after you disrupt and protest, you get people at the table to get their understanding. And then finally, it's policy. And policy can look like becoming a government official or writing policy yourselves based on those experiences, based on that awareness. So again, the different methods you can use are disruption and protests, town hall meetings and other forms of meetings, and policy creation. So again, on community organizing, to me, it's important to always have a goal, 
a goal that can be as broad or unique as you want it to be, but at least it's defined a philosophy that grounds your motivation so you can be clear on what your motivations are and they can keep you on the right path. And then finally, you have to have a thoughtful, a well thought out and informed method that's going towards the tactics or the outcomes that you want to see. So that's a little bit about community organizing. At the end, I'll take some questions about that if you have any specific questions. I wanted to be a little broad today, and hopefully we can come back and have more conversations about specific organizing tactics and some of the things we've done here in the city. Uh, one key thing uh, before I move on is it's always important to pass the torch. So always creating mentorship pipelines and relationships between and among generations. So a little bit about crime. So my dissertation research and my master's research are specifically on violence broadly. And so I'm very interested in understanding how we understand and see what violence is. So we, when we talk about violence, what are some things that come to mind? Just throw out some words, violence. What is violence? Crime, Crime. give me another one. Gangs. Gangs, what are some, so what, but what do I mean when I'm saying violence? What is violence? How do you know it's there? Because it hurts, a symbol of hurt. So what does that look like? Give me some, give me some more words. Guns. Guns. What was another one? Hurts one bait in the back. Pain. Pain. Give me one more. Destruction. Destruction. And that, that, that's my favorite one. Because when we think about violence, we can think about violence on all different levels, right? We can think about psychological violence. We can do symbolic violence, physical harm. Me, you, if I come and hit you, you you're going to call that pretty violent, right? All right. We can think about intergenerational violence. And one of my advisors, uh, Jeff Ward, writes about slow violence, violence that happens over generations and over and over and recreates themselves. And so I was very interested in how we understand the violence right here in Albany, Georgia. And so that's what my dissertation research is all about. It, it looks at violence during the Nelson Tiff era, who was the founder of the city, for those who you didn't know, uh, and looks at how he understood violence and culture. Then it looks and fast forwards to the civil rights era and looks at how they understood violence within the context of the movement. So was racial segregation a form of violence? And then I look at 1988. And anybody in here know what happened in 1988 in Albany? Anybody? It was the murder capital of America. So Albany had the highest per capita rate of murder compared to New York, Chicago, LA, and all these other larger cities. It had the highest rate, not individual number, but per population size. Albany had the highest rate of murder in the country at the time. And that was mostly due to domestic violence. A lot of people don't realize that and they think it's gangs, but it's actually domestic violence. So that kind of drives my work and I connect it finally to the current era and how we understand violence. So my dissertation used interviews and other methods to explore how we understand violence historically and today. And now another key aspect to my research and what kind of guided me to get where I am today is my research on immigration. How many people think that immigrants bring violence to wherever they move? Nobody wants to probably raise their hand on that. So the research, despite the media narrative that says immigrants bring violence, they bring crime, actually the research shows the opposite, the opposite effect. So if you want to look up some work by Sharis Kubrin and Greg Alsey, they have some wonderful work. Uh, she was actually my advisor on my uh, master's thesis that explored how violence actually goes down in places where, pe where immigrants go because they build strong networks and strong ties. And we know in places where we have stronger ties or collective efficacy, where communities can work together effectively and thoughtfully on a common goal, collective efficacy, that's where we see lower crime rates, and immigrant communities often do that. So I was interested in the mass immigration to the South. So since 1980, we've seen a mass immigration to the southern part of the United States for the first time. So historically, I wish I had a graph, but historically, the rate of immigration to other places has steeply gone up from the Midwest to the West to the North. The South has remained pretty flat up until 1980, so I wondered how Excuse me, I wondered how would immigration affect the crime rate in a place where immigration hadn't historically happened? And what did I find? So in places that had low immigration rates historically, I actually find that the, uh, the crime rate actually went up. And so I, I, I was like, why is this happening? We see in other areas, immigration, the crime rates goes down. It's about receptiveness. 
It's about receptive context. So in places where we see immigrants are allowed to build connections, allowed to build networks, we see the crime rate go down. But in the South, where historically there's been a lot of ostracism, given the racial legacy between black and white populations, we've seen that even in places where there are high black populations, immigrants, immigrants face a harder opportunity. So the decreasing crime effect of immigrants actually diminishes in the South. And so that's what my master's thesis was on. And so that led me to my whole kind of research enterprise that focuses on, again, violence, culture, and how the law interact. And so to me, moving forward, having a good research enterprise, which a good body of research, a good pattern of understanding a specific issue, which is what research is all about, can lead you to be an organizer. And as mentioned in my wonderful introduction, my research is what kind of led me to being part of the political process and being in front of you today. So I hope this was interesting enough and didn't bore you too much. I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you all for having me. That's a wonderful, wonderful and excellent question. So uh, there's a saturation effect that happens. And so those of you who may be familiar with saturation, so imagine a washcloth and you're filling it with water. Up to a certain point, you can't get no wetter, right? You can't, you, you can squeeze it out and then you put more water in it. But at a certain point, you can't put no more water in it. And so you, it can't get wetter. The same perspective is with saturation of police officers. So up to a certain point, the effectiveness of police officers diminishes. And this comes from the theoretical perspective of deterrence. Now, when you deter it from doing something, that means you're uh, trying to be stopped or, or hampered from doing the thing. And so deterrence says that the swiftness, certainness, uh, the, the swiftness, the certainty of this, and the severity of the, the punishment of the crime or surveillance, police officers are a form of surveillance, that's the greater likelihood that you won't do the crime again. So the effectiveness of the deterrent effect of cops diminishes up to a certain point. So a lot of the times uh, communities become over police and you see the crime rate actually go in the opposite direction because over policing actually breaks the trust between the police and the communities and thereby leads to people being more deviant and creating more deviant acts or taking the law into their own hands, which is what we often see. So to answer your question, there, it's a varied effect up to a certain point, and it's hard to measure what that saturation point is. And so that's why it's more important to think about police behaviors and how they navigate communities. And oftentimes when people say they're going to diminish the crime rate, they can't really say that because we have to consider all the multiplicative factors that go into the crime rate in the first place. Great question. Great question. And so community policing, uh, a lot of people are talking about community policing as, as if it's something new. People have been doing community policing since the late 70s, early 80s. And so that's something to, important to consider that uh, police officers have been building trust with, uh, with communities and building relationships. So I think it's important in that way to know what solutions are there and what outcomes are there. I think now in this coming era, we should focus more on problem-oriented policing and intelligence-led policing. Problem-oriented policing deals with the actual issues. Like here, we have an issue with domestic violence and gun violence. So throwing more police officers in the community won't necessarily lower the rates of domestic violence or gun violence because those things are happening in the home and gun violence is very fast and very swift. 
So my solution has been to increase the use of certain technologies like shot spotter. And this is technologies that recognizes the shot of a bullet using sound waves and it locates where it happens so police officers get there faster, saves the victim, and potentially catch the perpetrator faster. And uh, uh, intelligence-led policing uses collective resources to target specific behaviors, so it builds on problem-oriented policing to better deal with the crime issues. So I don't think we should get rid of community-oriented policing, but we have to be thoughtful of the biases and how it erases some of the biases that goes into policing that become invisible because you're simply giving ice cream to people in the community. We have to face the biases at an institutional and cultural level. Any more questions? Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. What what was the last part of that? Right. And so her question was all about this love ethic and how I would demonstrate that to particularly a, a youth, right, a middle schooler. And so that's a great question because my fiance is actually a sixth grade teacher. And my mother's been a teacher uh, for 30 years now. She's getting ready to retire. Uh, so happy for her. Uh, but they've taught me how to be compassionate and engage with kids and see them as uh, having potential and possibilities. I think it's all about empowering youth. And one of my solutions actually as a, as a mayoral candidate is creating a youth commission so they can experience creating policies. It is not just one person from each community. It should be about three people from each kind of neighborhood to create a large commission where we can get multiple voices and we can show kids how to work together, how to navigate. And also I'm a court certified mediator so I'm all about showing kids how to mediate disputes without using violence and show giving them the mediation skills and actually having them certified. Another thing is apprenticeship programs. So kids need to see where they're going. They need to see where they're coming from and where they're going. And some, a little black boy that grew up in Albany Homes can become a professor at Albany State. That's me. And so I think having examples like that are ways we show love and compassion to kids. Showing, uh, demonstrating an action, empowering them to do actions and seeing them as human and thoughtful creatures as well as we see adults. Yes, sir. In your studies, have you found a direct correlation between income level and crime? So yes. So you will see, and this, that's an excellent question because there's a difference between correlation and causation. Correlation simply means that there's a relationship. And so, yes, there's often in areas where we see uh, higher, uh, high levels of poverty, and Albany is a city like that, we see higher uh, levels of crime. But sometimes when you can control using multivariate analysis, uh, larger statistical packages, where you can control for other factors, sometimes the poverty effect goes away. But poverty is often one of the more, more persistent uh, uh, correlational things related to crime. So I would say yes, but we have to think about uh, poverty much differently. A lot of times we criminalize the poor instead of dealing with the issues that the poor face, like homelessness, uh, potential uh, to be more susceptible to drugs, potential to be more susceptible to <coughs> issues like joblessness, those other factors that lead to the need to commit crime in order to sustain one's livelihood. And so underground economies often happen in impoverished areas. That's where we get drug markets from. Um, uh, other vice markets like prostitution and these other kind of crimes that often lead to the more violent or type one crimes. So we have to deal with those low level crimes in order to deal with those upper level crimes as well. And poverty is a, often an undergirding factor. Got one more? Sure, 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 sure. So she asked me to elaborate more on the immigrant and crime relationship. So uh, Charis Krubin did a study looking at cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, and Miami. Uh, and these are some of the larger cities that have some of the larger uh, immigrant populations. Many of you may be familiar. These are some of the larger cities where we've seen consistent movement of immigrants over time since uh, the 30s, 1930s and beyond. And so what we've seen is that in areas that we've seen these populations increase, 
because many immigrant families move with families move with grandmother in the home, and we have a stay-at-home family that's a part culture and a part of necessity. And so because of those, uh, those communities, uh, they, they often, immigrant groups often fund, uh, create enclaves, what we call enclaves. Even, even here in Albany, Georgia, the immigrant population, that we, the growing immigrant population that we have here generally is co-located around Raven Springs areas. And so because of that, because there's a development of a mutual community, that's how we see protective factors where we have, you know, when you leave school, grandmother's waiting for you at home. You know uh, that if you're out late, somebody else is watching for you. The whole kind of, it takes a village to raise a kid mindset. We see that in action oftentimes in immigrant families. And so we found in these locations where there's a greater immigrant population because of those connections, that diminishes the crime rates. But again, in the South where a lot of times immigrant communities have been attacked, and I cite some of those attacks in my uh, master's thesis, uh, we see actually immigration brings up the crime rate. And they may not be a result of the immigrants themselves committing the crimes. I wanna be careful with saying that. It may just, it, it's a contextual thing, meaning that on the macro level, the crime rate itself goes up. So it's not saying that immigrants or non-immigrants bring up the crime rate. And then the same thing happens when we see the crime rate going now. It's not just immigrants not doing uh, crimes. It's the whole communities themselves not doing crimes. Hope I answer your question. Okay. We got one more. Thousands. Mm -hmm. And as far as renting through your company, because um, I just went through the same issue with my renter. You know, you go through the courthouse and file the paperwork that you're supposed to to get the allotted time to move out, but it's still up to that landlord who owns that house whether or not, regardless of if you paid that fee, whether or not they can kick you out of your home and right. you end up being homeless. So, how can you exactly address those issues when everything is at a disconnect? And, you know, people ultimately make the decision to do what they want to do, regardless. Great question. So she asked me, what am I going to do with about basically slum lords, the folks that abuse their properties and do all these things and, and, uh, and the high utilities bills, particularly on the different sides of town. So a couple of things. So one, we need a renter's bill of rights that really establishes a contract of what, beyond the lease, uh, a citywide ordinance that establishes what to expect from the landlord and what the renter should be expected to do as well. But things like maintenance, weatherization, those are some of the key things that landlords should be responsible for over generations. So those are some of the key things and that's uh, part of why some of the, uh, the utility rates are pretty high because these are some older homes, the rental properties are often dilapidated. I remember uh, when I moved back here, they showed me some rental property in like it was magical and it, and it, it really wasn't. And, and people, I, I interviewed people around the area and they mentioned my utilities rates are very high and it shouldn't be like that in a one bedroom apartment. And so do, we need a renter's bill of rights. The state of Georgia has preemption. And what that means is that we often can't create certain ordinances as it concerns uh, slumlords and, and renters and different things like that. So working with the state representatives to really evaluate what the renters, uh, what the landlords are doing and what utilities look like all around the state of Georgia. So as a researcher, I think we need to study the issue. Like we did a poverty study in 2009 and it came out in 2010. We need a utilities and renters uh, study because 60%, 60% of Albany's population is renters. That's not, that's, I won't say that's neither good nor bad, but that's something that we have to be consider, considerate of. So those are some of the things. 
In addition, we have some opportunity zones here, and that and what those zones are is where or, uh, institutions or organizations can get tax breaks based on where they locate in the community. So we need to be strategic and make sure we're looking uh, at diverse organizations or institutions and bringing them here to compete to make sure that we're getting the best. Oftentimes, people can come here and take advantage of Albany because it is a, a high impoverished location. So thinking about those things, and again, as a mediator, I'm all about building consensus rather than getting four votes on the commission. So I'm really thinking about drilling down and asking those hard, critical questions and playing devil advocate if deep beat to make sure we get to the best solution for whatever problem we have. Uh, so, so those are some of the things. Cross-community partnerships is one of the big important things that I wanted to do. So an east side community needs to be working with a west side community for some goal, for some outcome. Maybe we have a east side, west side week or something like that that builds new traditions in the community so we're all responsible for each other and build that collective efficacy that I mentioned that uh, shows to diminish the crime rates here in Albany, Georgia. So it's a holistic approach that I think would deal with the issue of poverty. I think also uh, music, arts, and culture. Uh, we talk about bringing industry here. That's one of the industries that we have to invest in right here that's in Albany, Georgia. And so we saw what Tyler Perry's done for Atlanta. We have the same, if not better, talent here. So thinking about innovative ways to, again, build apprenticeships, deal with uh, innovative ideas like music, arts, and culture, and again, bill of rights and legal ways to deal with the problems here in Albany, Georgia. Great question. And once you hear Mr. Edge's introduction, one thing that I told my students, I said, you would be amazed at the job opportunities that are available through the housing authority. So when she comes to introduce him, listen to the titles, listen to the types of certifications that he's gotten. And so jot those things down because you never know, hey, you know, if you never thought about working for the housing authority, um, I know people who make a very good living make a very good living doing that and your sociology your psychology degree your social work degree those things can get you prepared for those types of positions but my student is going to just give some statistics on what we found in class and that's going to be very brief and then after that we'll get the introduction of speaker and then the voice of uh, mr george edge the ceo of the housing authority of americas okay hello everyone my name is adisha bell i'm a student of professor jordan and I'm just going to give a little synopsis of Habitat for Humanity. So um, first off, Habitat of Humanity is a global nonprofit housing organization that helps provide decent and affordable housing for families that are in need. So um, they usually offer homeowners who buy homes and they invest their time and their money into making affordable housing for families that are in need. Um, some people, their mission is to seek to put God's love into action. Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, community, and hope. Also, their vision is a world where everyone, everyone has a decent place to live. Also, um, they have many sponsors like Home Depot, Lowe's, or Wells Fargo that helps supply the needs of things to build or repair in people's homes. Um, also, just to do a little statistics, 31.5% um, of all households are paying more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, also, 18 million, which is one in six, are paying more than half a, my bad. <laughs> okay. Only 9% of new unsubs unsubsidized apartments are renting for less than $1,000 and only 4% of less than $850. In, par in partnering with house in partnering with Habitat for Humanity, um, we can provide programs such as STEM programs and gardens to work to provide life skills for like children where we can partner with Aspire or YMCA to um, help like building and like Professor Pratt stated, help them work together in trying to prevent poverty. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm here to introduce Mr. George F. Edge. Mr. Edge is the Chief Executive Officer of the Housing Authority of Americas, 
He was appointed, he became employed with the Housing Authority of Americas on March the 17th, 1986 as occupancy specialist. He was manager of housing for several years and on February the 1st, 2018, he was appointed CEO designate. He is a certified public housing manager. He also serves as vice chair of the Management Committee of the Georgia Association of Housing and Redevelopment Authorities. He and his family currently reside in Americas. So let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Edge as he makes his way to the platform. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am so honored and blessed to be here today to share with you um, I'm also blessed that I did not come by myself. Um, my wife of 30.10 years, I'm about two months from being 31 years old in marriage. So I thank God for my wife. Um, by the way, who has been employed for Habitat for Humanity for 34 years. So I'm thankful for her. Um, she's the wind beneath my wings. So I am so blessed to have her here today. I'm also blessed to be able to come and share with you all. As I thought about change, um, I think change always requires some catalyst. You can be that catalyst, or a thing can be that catalyst, but there has to be a catalyst in order for change to take place. Someone has to be courageous enough to step forward and make a difference and be an instrument of change. Um, in the introduction, it was shared um, how long I've been with the agency, the Housing Authority of Americas. But actually, the, our agency was chartered in 1946 we began to build our first units in 1953. Um, and just out of curiosity, I started working at the Housing Authority in 1986. Was there anybody here born in 1986? <laughs> okay, I got one. <laughs> I got one person, so um, thank you, 1986. <laughs> I recognized on my first day on the job that I was being used as a catalyst for change. I could never forget the phone call that I received. An elderly lady called the office and she said, can you please send someone around here to get all of these little niggers out of my yard. First, I took a deep breath. <laughs> and I said to myself, Lord, don't let me lose my job <laughs> on the very first day. So I put the call on hold. And then I regrouped. What I told her was, let me, um, let me get a moment and get a complaint form to capture the nature of your complaint. But it was really a time for me to regroup. <laughs> so I got back on the phone and I said, um, ma'am, I have my complaint form. So I want to make sure that I capture the entire nature of your complaint. I said, can you give me some descriptive information about the niggers? <laughs> Hello, ma'am, are you there? <laughs> and she said, are you black? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I am. But I've got the complaint form. Can you give me some descriptive information about the niggers? She said, I'm sorry. 
these children are just playing in my yard. They're destroying my flowers that I've worked so hard to put out. And I said, ma'am, you should not have your flowers destroyed by anybody after the hard work that you put in to make your yard look good. I want to make sure that I handle your complaint. And she said, thank you very much. I chose to be a catalyst of change. And that's what you have to do in every day of your life. You have to make the choice to be a catalyst of change. I think at the end of that conversation, I had affected her and she had affected me. I realized then I did not have to react foolishly and ultimately end up jeopardizing myself. So I think it was a win-win situation at the end of the conversation. But that taught me that in the job that I am in, I am going to be confronted with various walks of people. But at the end of the day, it's my responsibility to win them. To win them, to cause change to take place. So since, since the housing authority's in inception, as I said, it was chartered in 1946. Out of those 73 years, there has been three executive directors slash CEOs. And standing before you now is the only African American out of 73 years. <laughs> Talking about change, at the same time, there's an African-American chairman of the Board of Commissioners of the Housing Authority of Americas. So you're talking about change. Change is something that you cannot stop. I saw an analogy one day and it said, if a car broke down, if three people got behind it to push and one person got in front of it to keep it from being pushed, the one person in the front will get ran over because they would not be able to withstand the three that were willing to push the car. As I look around in here, I see that you have consciously made the choice to be a pusher, to push our societies, to be the change that is many times needful. Our agency has 29 full-time employees. We have uh, two part-time employees. And we also have three um, part-time off-duty police officers that serve as our security patrol officers. So our agency, and any housing authority, um, it is a governmental or public body created and authorized by state law to develop and operate housing and housing programs for low-income families. We must ensure compliance with federal laws. And many times that conflicts with immediate needs. I meet people who are in de desperate situations, but sometimes policy and laws don't match needs. And many times I have to tell people, unfortunately, it is my regret that you have to wait. But because of policies, that is the case in many situations. Our goal as the Housing Authority of Americas, our goal is to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing. A young lady was on in, the, in my office on yesterday, and she said, I can't pay my rent because I've got to make my car payment. And unfortunately, sometimes those are the situations that people are placed in. If I don't pay my car payment, I lose my car. If I lose my car, I can't get to work. If I can't, if I can't get to work, then I can't pay my housing. So many times it's a catch-22 situation. And um, 
point at somebody and say, don't tell anybody. I recognize it's being recorded, but tell somebody, don't tell anybody. I try to do everything I can to make sure that that individual can maintain their housing. Housing is a need that every one of us in have, and, and that need is not going to go away. Our agency is very diverse. We have, um, we have three major programs. One is public housing. So we have 480 public housing units. I got a question, um, and, and please, in the midst of this presentation, if you have questions, just raise your hand. I don't mind stopping. Has there ever been a president of the United States that has lived in public housing? Does anyone? have an answer. Has there ever been a president of the United States that lived in public housing? Anyone have an answer? Yes. The answer is yes. Let's give him a hand. That president of the United States is the is, is none other than President Jimmy Carter. He lived in public housing in 1953 after being dismissed from the United States military for a few years. He lived in Plains, Georgia in public housing in one of the apartments that the housing authority has in his portfolio. Why did I point that out? I want to let you know you can be anything that you desire to be. Your income limit, your income limit does not determine that. You determine that. Where you live does not determine that. You determine that. President of the United States lived in public housing. I don't really real I don't think people realize the importance of the housing authorities across the United States. The public housing program has an annual budget of our public housing program has an annual budget of 2.7 million dollars. Wow. In addition I'm talking about annually. In addition to that, we receive capital fund dollars to maintain these properties. Um, Mr. Pratt was talking about many times, um, the, the problem with utility bill is not that the utility rate is the problem, but many times the housing is the problem. So right now we receive $1.3 million to maintain our units. Also, um, when you think about that, that's, a, that's a annually about $4 million for the public housing program. In addition to that, we have the housing choice voucher program AKA, somebody say Section 8, <laughs> is newly called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Our agency has 716 vouchers, and those are diverse among tenant based vouchers, project based vouchers, and portability vouchers, and home ownership vouchers. So, in other words, there's a tenant based voucher where the voucher follows the tenant. That tenant can move anywhere in Sumter County and that voucher will go with her or him. That's project based where the housing authority may enter into an agreement with the developer, they can develop the property and as long as those properties have a low income family in those units, then they receive subsidy from the housing authority but the voucher stays with the, uh, with the unit. You also have portability. Portability um, allows, and, and let me back up, it's called the Housing Choice Voucher Program because it put emphasis on choice as opposed to public housing. When you go into any city, most of the time you can identify the public housing units. Am I right? But with the voucher program, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, it allows the family to choose where they want to live. They choose the street, they choose the landlord, they choose the neighborhood, 
as long as it's within our jurisdiction. There's another aspect to the Housing Choice Voucher Program called portability. Now, portability is really the bomb. <laughs> With portability, a person can be issued a voucher in Albany, Georgia, or America's Georgia, and they can take their voucher and move to California. When they go to California, they do not have to reapply for eligibility. They, that agency has to automatically accept that voucher. And depending upon how that agency decides to use that voucher or utilize that voucher, it could be that they could absorb that voucher into their program, or they can say, um, America, this is what we're going to do. We're going to utilize your voucher. We're going to pay their rent, but you got to pay us back. Yes. The project, the project based voucher. So for instance, um, we had a developer in America's to build um, 80 um, duplexes and triplexes. And so in, in cooperation with that, we said um, for these 80 units, we are going to allot, um, we've got about 64, we're going to give you 64 vouchers to attach to those units. So as long as you keep low income families in those developments, then we will subsidize their rental payment to you. So we pay the difference between the rent for that unit and all of our participants' rent is based on 30% of their income. So whatever that individual's 30% of the income is, we pay that difference to that landlord. Uh, what, what landlord wouldn't agree to that? <laughs> it's, it's a definite, constantly flowing income stream. So we've, we've entered into that type of relationship with um, a developer there, and so as long as he um, we maintain our waiting list, so they maintain their waiting list, so they give them the apartment, we give them the voucher to subsidize the rental payment. Does that kind of... Her question was, is there a program that helps to utilize or, or reposition a family into home ownership? Is that yes. pretty much? Yes, there is. Under the Housing Choice Voucher Program, one of the other elements is home ownership. Home ownership. And, and the goal of the program never was for it to be a permanent place of residence for the family. It was designed to be a stepping stone to transition them into home ownership. So with the, with the home ownership voucher under the housing choice voucher program, the way it works, if that family can go out and secure a mortgage for that property, rather than their assistance payment going to a landlord, it goes to your mortgage. It goes to help pay your mortgage. Um, we have one person on our home ownership program now, and she had a 15-year mortgage, and she's about 13 years into her mortgage. So um, a part of that payment that she receives it, it's, it's the difference between her 30% and the mortgage. It also includes um, upkeep for the property. It includes a percentage for property taxes and insurance. But the sad reality is that has been in existence for so many years, but we only have one person that is utilizing it. Largely because, largely because, and this is a, this one is for free. <laughs> largely because 
they're not credit worthy. So, while you're in college, be mindful of that. <laughs> credit cards are not free, students. <laughs> a refund check from your institution may not be a free refund check. It could be a refund from a loan that you've taken out. But those things sometimes come back to haunt you. But our agency is so engaged about home ownership, we went out and we purchased, we purchased um, five acres of land for the purpose of development for homes so that those Section 8 participants could transition into home ownership. Our efforts are toward upward mobility. We want to see um, cycles be broken where we have families generational families living um, in public housing and receiving assistance. So our efforts sought to transition those families into home ownership. That's a wonderful opportunity. Um, the budget for the home ownership, pro I'm sorry, the housing choice voucher program is an annual budget of $3.5 million. The economy, the local economy of the housing authority is receives an infusion each year of $3.5 million. Those dollars are going to landlords. Those dollars are going to landlords to rent their properties on the program. But we want to transition some of those dollars from the landlord to the mortgage of the family. So, um, we also have a program under the Housing Choice Voucher Program called uh, Family Self-Sufficiency. So for instance, if a family um, develops a goal, family may have a goal, they want to um, achieve their associate's degree or their bachelor's degree. So as they work toward that goal, many times their income will increase because now they've got the associate's degree now they've got a job as an office manager, which equi equates to a rental increase, right? Because it's based on income. But this is what the Family Self-Sufficiency Program does. That increase that that family experiences, plus an additional percentage, is deposited into an escrow account. So once the family completes their goal, Guess who receives the escrow money in the account? Anybody got a, got a good guess? Who received? This is a smart young man back here. <laughs> yes. The question is, once that family achieves their goal, all of the monies that have been deposited into the escrow account Guess where that money goes? It goes into their pocket. It goes into their pocket. It goes into the individual's pocket. We have written checks for $10,000. What can you do with $10,000? <laughs> so the efforts are geared toward self-sufficiency becoming self-sufficient, independent of resources. When a person applies, there are some preferences that they may be eligible for. Our agency has a homeless preference. So if an individual can document they are homeless, that could be through um, a homeless shelter, that could be through um, a school guidance counselor that can identify that this child and his family is homeless. They receive a preference on our waiting list. They move to the top. Um, if an individual is, is sir, yes, yes, sir. So if a person is, um, we have a working family preference. And the goal behind that, and, and, I, I, and I strategically asked the question on purpose, income level and crime have a direct correlation. So we try to mix in income levels. 
So if there's a working family, then they receive a preference. And then because we cannot discriminate against persons with disabilities, then those persons receive that preference also. Um, involuntarily displacement, if there's some type of disaster, um, um, condemnation of a, a property that a person is living in, they could qualify for a preference. Um, we also have what we call our locally owned program. So our agency, through its own creative methods, went out, um, built, purchased, um, acquired various properties. So we have about um, 206 properties in our locally owned program. They have no federal assistance attached to them. So then we, we, we catch those people, we, we help those people, we assist those people who do not qualify for our program because of their income levels. But yet we also maintain those units at an affordable level because all of them are maintained at a rate that is lower than the market rate for um, properties. So we have that program and in the midst of that, after they become a resident, then we have a resident services program. And the resident program, the resident services program is there to keep our families engaged, to keep them involved, to keep them aware of programs and, and opportunities that they may have that they may not know about. So we constantly engage them. We, we publish a, a quarterly newsletter to make sure that all of our residents are informed. Um, most importantly, um, our goal is to help individuals on our program see themselves beyond where they are right now. That's our main goal. When a person comes in and they are paying um, a large amount of rent, we consciously try to steer them in another direction where they could possibly um, pay less on a mortgage than what they're paying for rent. Um, we also um, provide scholarships for our participants, but one of our greatest challenges is changing the mindsets of individuals. That's our greatest challenge. Each year we offer a scholarship. We send out letters. We send out letters to um, the high schools. We send out letters. We send out letters to the guidance counselors. And unfortunately, we had not one individual to apply. So I want to I wanna applaud you here today. You're in school. You're working towards your degrees. You're working to position yourself so that you can become a productive citizen, um, if not all being in some other area. So I applaud you for making those efforts to be a catalyst of change. So I want to encourage you for doing that. Um, again, we don't want public housing to be a repetitive cycle. We want those individuals to be there for the time that, that is needful. I'm glad you asked that <laughs> because I had a strong feeling that that was going to come up. College students can be eligible for our programs. Because of the income level. Now, I will admit this, I will admit this, it is easier to become a resident of public housing and not as easy for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. You know how one person can mess up things for everybody? So HUD discovered that what was happening you had these rich families with their children living in other states and had their children applying for Section 8, receiving it while they were rich back at home. Easy to do. So several years ago, they changed the requirement for students um, for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So now, to, to, to be eligible for the Housing Choice Voucher Program, 
you have got to be declared as an independent student. If you're an independent student, independent student could be that you have established residence in that area um, for, I, I believe it's for at least two years. Um, if you're over the age of 23 and you are a student, you're eligible on the basis of your income. But if you're under the age of 23 and you are applying, then it's kind of like filling out a fast for application. <laughs> Whose income do they want on the application? They want your parents' income. Same with the housing choice voucher program. Your eligibility will be dependent upon the income of your parents. It does not even matter if your parents are divorced. You have to get the income of both parents to determine your eligibility. Question right here. If you're an award, if you if you are an award of the state, you qualify. If you were in a foster care program, if you were adopted, if you were um, uh, in the custody of the state, you qualify. Yes. The comment was, if you are an emancipated adult, then um, you could qualify um, as eligibility, and that that is absolutely correct. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. A person that recently moved to the states, the question. So if the person, if the person recently moved to the state of Georgia, would they be eligible? Okay, the question is a person, if a person recently moved to the state of Georgia, would they be eligible? And the answer is yes. You, you, will, you will need to have a domicile for our area to be eligible. Driver's license, utility bill, those things like that, a legal address. But yes, you could, you would be considered eligible. Yes. Yep. Dr. Ben Carson, the secretary, current secretary of HUD, grew up in public housing. And that's why he's so passionate for housing and making um, op greater opportunities uh, for individuals that reside in public housing. Thank you all so much. Thank Dr. You. Jordan, thank you. All right, I know the crowd has dwindled down. I understand people had classes to go to, but this was amazing. I learned things that I did not know. As a college student, I would be making my plans because I would want my money in that escrow account because you said it dealt with the edu your education and the cost of your education. I would be, I would be making my to-do list, who I'm going to contact to find out information about that program. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Let's give him another <laughs> hand. And um, I want to just go ahead. Before you go, as a practical matter, I think I'm sure we have this discussion about private environment, <laughs> but is there some way that we wow. can have our students engaged in and put different types of facilities? Um, I'm quite sure we can work that out. Okay, we, I, I, would like, I would like to ask for a discussion and we do something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And, and also, I didn't know your wife had been with Habitat for Humanity for th over 30 years, so 34 years. So I definitely want to talk to you guys with the Sociology Club because we want to uh, show, have a pathway for students for their careers. If people can start interning, um, if they could start volunteering, um, all of those things, I would really like to um, uh, talk with you guys in more detail about how we can make that possible for our students. Um, so. Housing Choice Voucher Participants. Housing Choice Voucher Participants, okay, okay. All right, we said we would be done at six. It is 5.59, but before we leave, we would like to 
um, give this certificate to you, Albany State University Certificate of Appreciation. This certificate is awarded to Mr. George F. Edge for your presentation at the Community Symposium hosted by the Sociology Club and Social Problems Class Section 3. We thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, students, um, I hope that you were afforded a survey. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to do that survey. Um, you can basically leave it here. You can bring it down or you can just leave it where you are. Leave it on the table. Also, for those. Yes, if you want to join the sociology club, we have no officers now. We want presidents, we want vice presidents, treasurers, etc. If you're interested in joining the sociology club, um, please sign this interest form. We have this down here. We would love to have you start and be the catalyst for change on this campus through the sociology club. And without further ado, it's six o'clock on the dot. We have these wonderful cupcakes. If you got, please, Dr. LaMessi's wife is an amazing cook, I've heard throughout the university. So please come and grab these, take them out on your way out. Thank you students so much for coming. All right, thank you guys. Thank you.